The U.S. economy is in dreadful limbo, and at this point, every American wants to know how bad can it get. The one answer being proposed is that the historical collapse of the Soviet Union is a clear model for America's future. And joining me now is Dmitry Orlov, the man who proposed this theory that is gaining extremely popular ground. Thank you for joining me, Dmitry. Thank you. Great to be with you. You argue that the U.S. will soon turn into the former USA. What do you mean? I've been looking at this for uh, a couple of decades now, ever since the collapse of the Soviet Union, which I watched. And uh, ever since then, it had occurred to me that uh, the United States is basically uh, following the same trajectory as the Soviet Union followed. Uh, the timing is, of course, different, mm -hmm. but a lot of the things that doomed the Soviet experiment are also in the process of dooming the American experiment. And this revolves around politics, around militarism, around energy, and many other factors as well. Your book is called Reinventing Collapse, the Soviet Example and American Prospects. If you had to pick out your strongest correlation between the collapse of the Soviet Union and what's taking place now in the U.S., what would your argument be? Inability to grow the economy resulting in um, debt that has to be taken on at a completely unsustainable rate. What do you believe that the Obama administration should be doing now that you argue they're getting wrong? They're trying to restart the economy. They have learned nothing from the run-up in commodities prices that uh, preceded this collapse. And so restarting the economy is the wrong move. They have to start building a different economy based on, not on continuous growth and exponential expansion, but sustainability. And in fact, they could do pretty well even if they didn't grow the economy, provided they uh, did a good job and, and provided for the, for the welfare of the people in the country. Gave them the basics, you know, gave them food and shelter and transportation and security. So what do you have then left? Just a country that's surviving? Yes, and in fact, that's pretty good, because if you compare that to the Soviet example, a lot of people died unnecessarily. A lot of lives were ruined and cut short. There was a flood of refugees. That is all completely avoidable here. So what you're arguing is that the collapse of America is unavoidable. What Americans can prepare for is how bad the consequences you say will get. That is basically what I'm saying. I think that you know you could compare what's going on in the United States to a tsunami or a hurricane or an asteroid impact. It's something that's been in the making for a long time. It is going to happen. And talking about averting it is just a, basically a waste of time. What we should be talking about is how we can prepare it and build a different, different society, perhaps, different ways, different economy that's at a much lower level of resource expenditure that provides the basics that people need to survive and have decent conditions. What is the most important thing that Americans can do right now to prepare for the worst if it is to come? I think the most basic people have to do, thing that people have to do in this country is meet their neighbors. Uh, everybody walks around talking on their cell phones, ignoring the people directly around them. There's very little face-to-face -face communication. There's very little sense of community. Uh, people have a very sort of boxed-in sense of what's mine and what's yours and, and refuse to share. People should try to get to know each other and try to, to work out arrangements where they, they share responsibilities and where they, they, they share whatever they have. You know, for instance, uh, people, a lot of people don't need to have their own car. They could share a car amongst friends. Uh, you know, I've done it with friends. That's a, a specific thing that people can start doing that, that will work for them. That actually speaks to your argument that the Soviet Union, the people living in the Soviet Union, were more capable of surviving the collapse than Americans are capable of surviving a collapse. Why do you think so? Well, that is actually a big part of my, my argument, which is in a collapse, a lot of positives becomes, become negatives and vice versa. So, for instance, the housing crisis in Russia meant that, you know, families were uh, living in cramped apartments, three generations all living together on top of each other. Well, after collapse, it means that they were on hand to help each other. So the grandparents could uh, take care of the children while... while uh, while the adults were, were out doing something, trying to survive. 
Um, and, you know, commu big communal apartments, of course, are, are not that great, but they're very cheap to heat. So if you have, a, you know, a fuel crisis, it's very helpful, much better than, you know, suburban housing. Um, many other examples like that. Uh, private cars are con convenient, but and public transportation not so. But if you have a gasoline shortage, then you have public transportation. That can be a lifesaver. Your predictions on the security of this country are quite frightening. And you base your theory on the instability you witnessed following the collapse of the Soviet Union. Well, I was in Russia during periods of time when people thought I was insane to even go there. Um, and, and during that time, uh, some friends of mine got killed. A lot of people got, got mugged and terrorized. And I, I just saw the environment. Uh, you know, I, I, would, I would get on a train, and you know, some of the passengers were escorted on board with, by soldiers armed with Kalashnikovs because that was the security environment. You know, I, I heard of uh, you know, various rent-a-cop schemes where you have to pay off a policeman to do this and that. Once there's a collapse, the only skills they have are these violent skills involving weapons, and, and, and uh, uh, that's how they make money. So unless somebody finds something useful for them to do, work in security, then they'll go into business for themselves, and so much the worse for everyone else. Uh, this country maintains over a 1,000 overseas military bases. Uh, once those budgets start dwindling because the tax base is shrinking and you know the deficits can't be financed, uh, those soldiers will have to be brought back, and those bases will have to be shut down. So that means a lot of soldiers and no economy, no domestic economy to reintegrate them into. Uh, the prison population is uh, per capita largest in the world, and uh, right now it's being whittled down. California is in the process of releasing, uh, I think, 50,000 of them. A lot of states will, will end up paroling prisoners, so there will be a flood of prisoners, basically in the same situation, uh, where they, there isn't a domestic economy for them. They will have to find some way to, to find what they need, uh, possibly through violence. Dimitri, what should people be doing with their money right now? Because the popular answer is buy gold. But what if people only have a little bit amount of savings? What should they be doing with their dollars? The easiest thing to do with a little savings is to um, start um, a tiny little business. Not necessarily a going concern, but get the tools together. So if you're good at carpentry, buy carpentry tools and supplies. If you're good at sewing, for instance, get a really good sewing machine and everything you need to do that. Because in the future, you will be able to survive by making money with these things when the money itself is gone and the money you have now is worthless. But in general, the way to invest money in, in a collapsing economy is to invest it in ways so that you lose it slowly over time as opposed to all at once. What will happen to the rest of the world? if America collapses? Because this crisis is a global crisis. What will happen to the European countries? What will happen to Russia, China, India if America collapses? A lot of countries will go through a political upheaval um, for two reasons. One is the middle class in those countries is very dependent on, on, on America more than anybody else. They're, de they're dependent on international finance and commerce. Once that goes away, uh, they pretty much have nothing more to offer to their own people, so their own people will rebel. Um, so there will be a conflict between these middle class elites and all of the populations that they have been nominally in charge of all these years while the times were moderately good. Mm -hmm. So there, there will be a, a, lot of, a lot of rebellion throughout the world. You say that at this point you consider what you're doing a community service, what you're doing, lecturing, you have a blog that's very popular, you've authored a book, you've written many articles and it's a community service for Americans? Every time I've tried to, uh, to stop, uh, a flood of emails comes in begging me to continue. So I can't disappoint that many people. What are people saying? What do they want to know? A lot of people ask the same question over and over again, which is when. You know, I get, I get desperate emails. I, I, have a, I have a bride in the Ukraine. Will the United States hold together for the next six months because it'll take us that long to get a visa? That sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that was one of the most desperate pleas I got so far. But a lot of people want to know about timing, and I can't give them that information. Mm -hmm. uh, what I can do is point people towards a, a great deal of resources on how they can help themselves and, and restructure their lives and try to get out of debt, for instance. You know, maybe take up a little bit of farming so that they have some food coming in. From what I read, you proposed that if people are paying rent or a mortgage, you don't have to pay anymore. If you go to work, 
don't overwork yourself because that job is going to come to an end either by the person getting fired or quitting. Is that a little bit radical? You're saying don't pay your bills and don't try hard at work? A lot of my proposals are, are, are basically dares. I, I dare people to think through the consequences and, 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 and I, I'm hoping that that helps people get off the autopilot and actually live in ways that, that, that are more meaningful. Mm -hmm. Uh, that they, they become be, begin to understand why they're, they're doing what they're doing. I don't expect, actually, you know, everybody to, to go into foreclosure by listening to my talk. Dimitri, in terms of preparing for a collapse, I understand you practice what you preach. You also invested in a boat so that um, you would eventually be able to get into the shipping business and undercut the cost of trucks and this is sort of like a survival method that you have come up with. Actually, this is part of a business plan. Uh, a bunch of my associates and I are putting together a sail transport network. The idea is to ship organic produce from farms along the coast to population centers using sailboats and sell them at farmers markets that are right at the dock side. Mm -hmm. This is a completely carbon-free method of supplying food to population centers that's not dependent on anything except sunshine and soil and water and wind. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you.